Last week, you learned the basics of this system that we'll be using to test uh, for the enzyme activity, the activity of salivary amylase in uh, using a micro titer array with uh, preloaded drops of Lugol's iodine. And so we're going to start off by just uh, reviewing what you know, make sure that you understand the nature of the system. Uh, we started off with 2 mLs of starch, that would be 0.25% uh, starch, uh, and plus 2 mLs of a, of a pH 7 buffer, uh, making 4 mL total. And to that we added 1 mL of a dilution of enzyme, which you uh, calibrated very carefully so that we would get a reaction that's not too fast or not too slow. Okay, and then after mixing it up very thoroughly, uh, we basically added it to these microtiter arrays, one drop from the reaction mixture every 30 seconds. So if you were uh, good and followed instructions, you would have loaded the first well at zero seconds. In other words, as soon as you added the enzyme, uh, mix it up and immediately add a drop to the first well. Um, there might have been some delay, but the, uh, with, we try to get uh, one reading as close to zero as possible. And after that, every 30 seconds. Okay, and if you did everything exactly right, um, basically you probably had to go through a couple of trials in order to get this point. Um, just right, not too fast, not too slow, would probably give you results that kind of look something like this. So uh, it looks like after 30 seconds, we still had some uh, starch in the mixture, and therefore it would turn color. Starch was still there at 60 seconds, starch is still there at 90 seconds, but at 120 seconds, there's no more starch. In other words, the uh, enzyme has completely uh, eradicated all the starch in the reaction chamber <coughs> by 120 seconds. And, and from that point forward, you can keep on adding drops to the uh, Lugol's iodine in the rest of the wells, but you're not going to get any results. Okay. Um, if the uh, enzyme in the reaction mixture was too weak or very weak, uh, you might have gotten a result that looked more like this, where uh, you know no matter how long you uh, you waited, the starch was still going to be there. Okay, and if you uh, had a reaction that was way too strong, uh, probably a lot of you started with results that probably look like this, uh, where uh, even after you know, like zero seconds or five seconds or how, however long it took you to add starch to the first well, uh, the uh, enzyme had already destroyed all the starch. And um, and so you want to, you know, obviously if you don't have any reaction in well zero and uh, and the next well, if you're not getting any reaction whatsoever, that means there's starch is gone already. So there's really not too much point for you to continue adding the reaction mixture to the rest of the wells. It's not like the starch is going to reappear magically after a certain point. Okay. Now the other thing that we did was to uh, set up controls. Controls are very important because they allow you to validate that what you did was actually right. So with the control tube, we basically set things up exactly the same with the only difference being that we didn't have any enzyme in the reaction mixture. Uh, in place of 1 ml of enzyme dilution, we had 1 ml of just straight up water. And when we added this to the, uh, when we started adding this to the uh, micro titer array, the results should look like, well, what should the results look like? Now, if you're really on top of things, you should have gotten that the uh, control would be giving you results that look kind of like what we had for the no reaction because obviously with uh, with water in there in place of the enzyme we expect there to be no reaction there's, there's no enzyme to break down the starch so the starch is never going to disappear if the starch never disappears then we keep adding it to the iodine it keeps turning color okay so that's uh, the right answer okay now um, in setting up this week's laboratory, there are a few things we want to make sure that you understand about enzymes generally um, and, the, and the whole nature of, of proteins. And so we're going to be backing out of this. I don't see any of that. And we're going to be thinking about the, uh, the causes of protein shape. So back from uh, module three, you uh, should remember that in the case of protein shape, we start off with just this linear array of amino acids. We might have an alanine and a serine, etc. So basically, this is going to uh, be, you have a really long chain of amino acids. It's a polypeptide, and that's the primary conformation or structure for the protein. And then we have the secondary shape, 
secondary shape is going to consist of alpha helices, beta sheets, beta strands, alpha helices, beta strands that run and create these little pleated sheets. It goes on and on. Basically, we have these secondary structural motifs, alpha helices, beta, beta pleated sheets, and that results from the hydrogen bonding between the um, NCC backbone elements. And then uh, finally, or maybe not quite finally, but in some cases finally, we have the tertiary level of protein shape in which this structure folds up in a very specific way into a three-dimensional shape. Okay, So maybe it's going to look something like this with the alpha helices over here, beta pleated sheets, and it's going to take this particular shape that's required in order for the enzyme to function. Somewhere on the uh, enzyme there's going to be this active site where the enzyme is going to be able to interact with its substrate. In our case, the substrate might be starch molecules, and the starch molecule will come in here and it'll be broken down into maltose or glucose. And so that's basically the reaction that gets catalyzed by the enzyme when it's in its native shape. Okay. Now, uh, for our laboratory, this might be salivary amylase, the, the substrate might be starch, um, and we're talking about what happens when the enzyme takes its perfect shape. Now, this perfect three-dimensional shape that the protein takes is going to be dependent on the environment, and here's where experimental variation comes in. We can alter the environment, and the changes that we make to the uh, environment could have some impact on the shape that the protein takes. For example, you know that if the pH is really low or really high, uh, we might have the H pluses. H plus is going to have the effect of uh, attaching to any structures that are going to have a negative charge. So if we have a negative charge on the protein, H plus is going to be <coughs> interfering with this. For example, there might be a there might be a part of the protein that normally has a negative charge. If we have a lot of hydrogen ions, in other words, we have a very low pH environment, the H pluses are going to be attracted to this negative charged portion of the protein, and it's going to neutralize this out, right? If we have a very high pH, we'll have a lot of OH minus ions, and the OH minus ions are going to have the same effect on positively charged portions of the protein. Okay, now keep in mind that the presence of positive charges and negative charges on the polypeptide are what's going to make the polypeptide take this three-dimensional shape. And so if we alter the charges here, these char if these charges don't carry the charge that they're supposed to have, then we're not going to be able to maintain this perfect shape. So what's going to happen is that we might have denaturation. Okay? <clears throat> With denaturation, this perfect protein shape, instead of looking the way it's supposed to look, it might kind of look kind of tweaked out of shape. Maybe instead of looking like this, it's going to start looking something like that which case is no longer active, right? And so, yeah, the uh, native protein shape that it takes might normally require a pH of 7, and under a pH that's either too high, uh, pH 11, or pH that's too low, pH 3, um, the structures, the charge structures of the polypeptide are not going to allow the protein to take its normal shape. We end up with a altered three-dimensional shape, we, act, we, uh, uh, we mess up the active site and the protein, the enzyme, is no longer going to be able to do its job. The uh, substrate won't have any place to attach and there's going to be no opportunity for the enzyme to convert the substrate into the product. Okay, so that's going to happen under uh, low pHs. Pretty much the same thing is going to be happening with alteration to the temperature. If the uh, temperature gets too high, if we get too hot, even though the uh, pH might be uh, perfectly normal <coughs> with, uh, with excessive heat, the, uh, the kinetic energy, remember uh, temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles. So the protein starts jiggling faster and faster. It starts to, to, uh, to splay outwards. And instead of taking its normal shape, it's going to look something like that. It's kind of like what happens when uh, egg white denatures and we end up having a completely inactive enzyme call this denaturation. Right? <clears throat> okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's one thing that can happen to an enzyme under conditions that are less than ideal. Another thing that can happen uh, with an alteration of temperature is if the enzyme is excessively cold. We're not necessarily, if, we're, if it's too cold, 
we might be altering the protein shape, but it's probably not going to be altering the protein shape that much. Okay. Uh, the issue of, of when things get too chilly is that the rate of the interaction between the starch molecules, instead of the starch molecules moving relatively quickly, uh, they're moving uh, really fast, uh, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for a starch to bump into the enzyme. If the starches are kind of like barely moving because the system has gotten really cold, then even though the enzyme is perfectly able to interact with the starch, it's not going to go out and look for the starch. It has to wait for the starch to bump into it. And the starches aren't moving, we're not going to get a very high rate of interaction between the enzyme and the substrate. Okay. And so under conditions that are too cold, we expect the overall enzyme activity, the rate of conversion of starch into maltose, to slow down, slow down the reaction that is catalyzed by the enzyme. Okay. Uh, when we talk about salinity, this is kind of interesting because in the case of salinity, we have to consider one more thing. First of all, uh, we have to take into account the idea that in order for the enzyme to take this native shape, in solution. In other words, this enzyme is floating freely in a lot of water molecules. We've got water molecules all around here, right? But these water molecules are also associating with the enzyme. We've got this thing that's called the hydration shell. And it, what, what happens with this hydration shell is it keeps the protein suspended in the water molecules. It's kind of like the protein is able to dissolve, right? And what happens is that if things get too salty, if things get too salty, these uh, sodium ions and the chloride ions are going to take the hydration shell away, which is going to cause the proteins to start doing things that they don't normally do. Uh, in other words, it's kind of like if you sort of visualize it underneath all those water molecules, the protein is really sticky. Uh, what you're going to get is a whole bunch of sticky proteins aggregating to each other. Uh, this is actually kind of similar to what happens in the protein aggregates that cause Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's plaques um, occur in, in uh, neural tissue because the proteins, uh, the amyloid proteins, start to stick together to form these plaques. And so if the proteins start to uh, stick to each other, instead of getting having a whole bunch of proteins that are free to interact with uh, the substrate molecules, all the protein molecules start to glom up together. To make this gigantic mess, which is not going to be able to interact with the substrates either. Some of you might be familiar with the idea that you can actually cause uh, a soup. If you ever make soup, sometimes adding salt will cause the proteins to float to the surface. And that's because these aggregates uh, will form. They end up you know, getting a little bit of trapped air on the inside. They float to the surface and you can skim it off. It's actually something that causes your, your soup to become a lot more clear. Okay, so, so, so basically the idea here is that um, things that we do to the environment, either making the environment either more acidic or more basic, uh, that can cause denaturation. If we make the environment too warm, it can cause denaturation. If we cause the environment to become too cold for what the enzyme likes, it's, gonna, it's not necessarily going to cause denaturation. There might be some alteration of shape, but the principal effect is going to be in, the, in changing the kinetics. It's going to cause the a reaction to slow down uh, because of the way in which the uh, proteins and the substrates are interacting at a much slower pace. Uh, in the case of changing salinity, uh, we can do a couple of things. Uh, the first thing might be a direct effect on protein shape. So in other words, there's some denaturation type effects, but uh, another really important way in which uh, excessive salt is going to cause proteins to stop activity uh, is by causing them to salt out because we're altering the, the hydration shell, the water molecule shell surrounding each protein molecule. Okay. And so that's the basic underlying idea. This, you know, this is why we're going to be taking our experiment, uh, the, uh, the finely tuned uh, machine that we developed last week, and we're going to be uh, running some uh, alterations. Okay, so if you take that basic design of having 2 ml of starch with 2 ml of buffer and the enzyme dilution at the very top, uh, we worked out exactly how much enzyme dilution we wanted to add. We're not going to change that. We're not going to alter the amount of starch that's there. I mean, we could theoretically do those as well, but we're going to be keeping things simple. And we'll be, um, uh, at least for the for pH and for salinity, we're going to be um, manipulating uh, 
the uh, the pH and salinity by changing the buffer that's used. Okay, take for example the pH manipulations, and this is something that you might be doing. So some of you are doing pH manipulations. Um, instead of using pH seven, we'll, we'll be using pH three, pH five, pH seven. We'll be alter. We'll be manipulating the pH of the system. In other words, we're putting the we're putting the enzyme together with a low pH environment, a high pH environment, and the entire range. Uh, when we look at the entire array, uh, one of these pHs that we'll be testing this week is going to be pH 7. And pH 7 is exactly the same setup that we had last week. I know we did it last week, but you're going to replicate it this week again because uh, this is going to be your, kind of like your validation that we actually are getting a comparable results to what we had last week. And so, yeah, as we do this, you might expect there to be some change in the uh, enzymatic activity and the different pHs. Okay. And, and so it's a, it's a pretty straightforward uh, kind of thing. If we're going to, if instead of pH manipulation, you're thinking about the salinity variation, what we'll be doing is we'll be changing the sodium chloride concentration of the buffer. We'll have pH seven buffer, but instead of having pH seven buffer with zero percent salt, sodium chloride. We're going to add sodium chloride to the pH 7 buffer. We can have it at 10%, 20%, 30%, or 40%. And so, um, and so when we do this manipulation, the 0% result should be giving us the same result that we had last week. Kind of like it's, again, it's our validation that what we got last week is still what we're getting this week. And then by altering the... Uh, the percent of sodium chloride, I, I, I just put here 10, 20, 30, 40. The actual numbers of sodium uh, chloride concentration um, percentages might be different for your experiment. Okay, so yeah, we'll, we'll be doing this. Uh, we'll be setting things up. We're also going to be setting up a control too, right? You have to have controls. If you don't have controls, then your experiment's basically no good. Okay, in this case, for example, sodium chloride, your controls are going to look like this. Right, so yeah, this is uh, here's our setup. Um, we'll be setting up exactly the same uh, tests, only with water in place of the enzyme dilution. We need to validate, for example, that uh, we get results that are expected in the absence of enzyme for all of these salinities that we have. Um, who knows? Maybe there, there might be a, a different response of water to the starch and the pH buffers in these other conditions, and we need to test that. In other words, we ha always have to uh, run an appropriate control. You'll be doing the same thing for pH. Okay, For pH, uh, for the ranges of pH, you'll be running the same experiments that you do with the, uh, with the enzyme dilution using water. It's going to be another uh, control, a set of controls that you have to do. Now for the temperature manipulation, um, it's going to be a little bit different. We're not going to be changing the uh, pH 7 buffer. We're not going to be altering the setup. All of the uh, tests that will be running are going to be uh, using the same enzyme dilution, the same pH 7 buffer with 0% sodium and chloride, and the same starch 0.25% substrate. Okay? Uh, we will be altering the temperature, and, and you get to choose which temperatures you'll be using. I recommend that you, you uh, select temperatures ranging from what you think will be too cold uh, to too hot. And you'll have to set up uh, water baths, uh, maybe ice water baths for something close to zero degrees Celsius. Room temperature would be, uh, well, you probably don't need a water bath for that. It's just room temperature. Uh, you could set up a water bath close to body temperature, like 37.4 degrees maybe something a little bit warmer than body temperature, like maybe 45 degrees, uh, and something that you think might be pushing the enzymes toward uh, denaturation, so you know, 70, 80 degrees Celsius, right? And so uh, you'll be using water baths to adjust the temperature, uh, and t when you do this, I, um, there are a couple things that I recommend that you do. Okay, so uh, you can premix the starch in the buffer. Um, the enzyme, you want to have that... Uh, in a tube ready to add to the starch in the buffer, but you need to pre-chill or pre-heat, pre-warm both the enzyme and the starch buffer. Okay, so I'm, I put chill, but I, I meant uh, you bring the enzyme and the starch buffer separately up to the temperature that you'll be having as your target. Okay, and then you'll mix them. You, you don't have to have them 
in the water bath when you mix them because you'll need to, to, to agitate it up really nicely. But as soon as you agitate it up, you'll add the first drop to the first uh, uh, well, the micro titer array, but put it back in the uh, in the water bath to keep it at the target temperature for the entire duration of the reaction. Okay, so you, you mix up the enzyme and the starch buffer, and then you uh, put it back in the water bath. Put it back in the cold water bath. You can put it back in the warm water bath. Um, it's not necessary to alter the temperature. You don't need to put the micro titer tray in the water bath. It won't fit anyways. No, don't worry about doing that. Uh, the uh, the iodine in the micro titer tray is simply to test whether the starch is still there. So I don't see any reason why you need to to alter the temperatures there. And of course, you'll be running the same set of tests uh, with water, uh, lacking the enzyme. Okay. And so when you're done with your experiment, uh, you should uh, be graphing your results, following the instructions in the lab manual or the, uh, the handout that you, that you have printed out, and you'll be presenting your results to the entire class at the end of the laboratory. Okay, so we're going to have a, uh, a final uh, 20 to 30 minutes in which all the groups from around the class will be telling the rest of the class what they found with their uh, manipulations of temperature, pH, or salinity. And that's what you'll be doing this week. See you in class.